So we're going to do a quick lightning round with Jeff on the five definitions. We want to give you some of the technical terminology uh, to help you understand all the stuff that you might be reading and that's being thrown around. Um, we're trying to give you just the words and concepts that we really think you do need to understand in, in order to be able to, to use these tools effectively. So you ready, Jeff? All right, we'll go. Forget it. All right. So these are the terms that every business owner must know. We'll start with generative AI. What's that? All right. So generative AI is a very specific type of artificial intelligence that helps you make new stuff. So we've had AI for a long time, like email spam filters or even your phone, which will recognize your face when you unlock it. Generative AI is a new class of tools like Dolly or ChatGPT that produces new content as opposed to just understands content. Perfect. And one of the benefits of generative AI is that the content it creates is yours. So the copyright issues, I know there's some questions around imagery, but at least with text, the copyright issues uh, appear to be that you can use generative AI text um, if you're, as long as you're not in a school where they're going to kick you out for using it. And there are tools now that detect when it's been built by generative AI. Uh, and as long as Google doesn't punish you for posting it, because there are tools now for uh, detecting a generative AI, it, it's yours to use from a legal standpoint. The ethical standpoint and the practical, uh, that's still being de de debated and determined. All right, next up, prompt engineering, the kind of focus of today. Yes. Well, I'll give a high level introduction since we're going to spend a lot of time on this. Prompt engineering is essentially the process of designing prompts for these machines so that you get a useful output back out of them. And just like, just like a creative process or a strategy process, if you put garbage in, you'll get garbage out. There's really an art and, and, a, and a very advanced technique to getting the kind of results you want out of these machines. And we'll spend a lot of time on that today. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is helpful, but I work with a firm, um, a, a, a VA firm that's based overseas, and I often have to write them like really detailed emails with instructions on what to do. And I, I learned actually the technique for how to do that from a guy named Tim Ferriss from the 4-Hour Workweek. And one of the chapters in there is how to write prompts for a VA. And when I got to ChatGPT, it felt super familiar, and I realized you know, I've been doing prompt engineering with my virtual assistant for years. So if you're really good at writing standard operating procedures, or if you're really good at writing instructions that are really clear to your team, you're going to find prompt engineering is a very natural skill. All right, next, this is one that I wasn't aware of, reinforcement learning. Great. So reinforcement learning is the idea of teaching an AI model by having it do things and then either rewarding or punishing the behavior. In this scenario, that reward or punishment could just be a thumbs up or thumbs down. But it's a way that we can take a generalized machine and teach it to do a bunch of really cool stuff that it wasn't explicitly programmed to do. An analogy you'll often hear in the technical circles is it's a lot like training a child. And they even sometimes use metaphors of... Uh, um, these uh, machine learning systems as being in their childhood or adolescence. Um, on a personal level, uh, my son is learning how to potty train. He's three years old. And every time he goes pee pee, uh, he gets a matchbox car. And I'll tell you, man, it is working a charm. Like we have run through about 10 matchbox cars, but it is accelerated his learning of how to potty train. So it's really the same idea. That's, that is reinforcement learning at, at its best. Great. And then we have a concept called temperature. So temperature is specific to language models, but you actually also see it in some of the image generation stuff like Dolly or mid journey or stable diffusion. Temperature is essentially an amount of randomness that a machine uses when outputting text or outputting imagery. The reason this is important is when you have low temperature, an, a generative AI like ChatGPT generates very robotic specific text and then if you have very high temperature it starts talking about crazy stuff and so true humanity and creativity is probably somewhere in between those extremes but you see this a lot in these ai tools where there's a balance between something being robotic and boring and something just not making any sense at all and that's a concept called temperature that's used in these tools yeah so uh, my wife calls, right? And we're out at the bar and I'm like, hey guys, I'm so sorry. I have to go home. That's a low temperature response. 
I have to go to Disney World. That's an extremely high, slightly deranged temperature response. And so somewhere in between is where creativity lies and where the human brain uh, lies. And that kind of valence and that kind of surprise, that interesting use of language is, is where a lot of great writing comes from. And, and that's what higher levels of temperature uh, will allow for, but it will also create some really wacky stuff as well. And it's part of why some of the newer models sound so much more human is they haven't been so robotic in nature with the way that they, they generate text. Um, emergence. So we just talked about this. This is the black box. When you train language models with larger and larger sets of data, or you add layers to the neural networks that generate the text with these machines, you actually start to see emerging features that you're not explicitly training, the ability to write code, the ability to do math, speak in Spanish, answer questions. All of these are things that the machine learned how to do on its own without us explicitly training it. So that is super cool. And it's led to a ton of just wild advancements that we're all really excited about. It's also a bit concerning. This is when you start hearing people that are concerned about the evolution of AI. It's because we don't know what the next feature that emerges will be. You know, we've already had issues with things like chat GPT, where it teaches somebody how to create a bomb or it teaches somebody how to hijack a plane. Like these are very dangerous behaviors that we have to be careful with. And it's part of why you're probably going to see a lot of back and forth as we, we use more of these tools with regulation and what the responsibility and ethical responsibilities are of these companies to make sure that we are doing the right thing for science and humanity, but also being very careful with how we roll these things out. And when you watch the horror movie about AI, inevitably, the thing that they focus on is emergence. When the doll takes the turn and suddenly begins to uh, interpret its mission to protect the daughter at all costs, right? Which might mean killing everyone in order to make sure she's safe. And, uh, you know, we've heard Elon Musk go apeshit on this. Uh, he calls it the AI apocalypse. But it's not just Elon, and he's not barking up a tree. Engineers from Amazon, DeepMind, Google, Meta, and Microsoft, along with the co-founder of Apple, Steve Wozniak, signed an open letter calling for a six-month moratorium on AI system building. They said, ChatGPT4 is too powerful. We don't know what it's going to do. We need to stop. And nobody listened. The race is on. You know, Google has been kind of quiet, but you got to remember they're the ones who invented the LLM. They were the founders, uh, along with other engineers of OpenAI. They have been at this for longer than anyone, and they have every ounce of search data and experience at their fingertips. The only reason they haven't launched more is out of caution. They are far ahead of almost anyone else. And they're starting to throw caution to the wind. And that calculation, right, um, of do we go quickly or do we go cautiously is starting to change. You know, for the last two quarters, Google announced that they had lost money uh, compared to where they were. This is impacting their bottom line. People are moving to Bing as their primary search engine. Every 1% of search that Bing takes on, Microsoft gains a billion dollars in, uh, takes a billion dollars in revenue away from Google, their number one competitor. So the folks at Microsoft are thrilled, but guys, this is just the first foray, the first small skirmish in what is gonna be a years long war. And don't count Google out. Anyone who does that it, it has no idea what they're talking about. So. We're going to keep up to date on the up, upcoming changes that come from Google. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about Elon Musk because he does keep coming up. Um, he has actually a really interesting relationship to OpenAI. He was one of its founders. In 2015, he was a co-founder of OpenAI, which started out as a nonprofit. And it was very specifically dedicated to responsible AI. So there's kind of an irony here about how heedless some say they've been and then going from a nonprofit to a for-profit. So Elon, when he co-founded it, he invested $100 million to help its launch. And then in 2018, he said, no, he stepped down from the company's board. He sold his stake to Microsoft uh, and he began a public crusade against the AI apocalypse. And today, uh, recently, he called OpenAI, quote, 
a closed source, maximum profit company effectively controlled by Microsoft. And we actually, Ross actually commented, uh, Elon Musk also then founded his own AI company after calling for a moratorium. So uh, we don't know if that's FOMO or questionable motives, but he, but he you know, claims he wants to make sure this is open source and that the world has access to the underlying tools. Yeah, so the next the time, yeah, exactly. 